And as I mentioned in our previous sermons, we have 28 or some odd chapters in the book of the Acts. And um, as a result of the series, uh, we're not going to have 28 different sermons. Um, I do want to encourage you uh, to join us for Bible study uh, on Wednesdays. We use our Facebook Live platform to conduct Bible studies together, and we're going through each of the chapters um, during those Bible studies. And so it'll be a great opportunity for us to get a little bit more uh, in depth into the book of the Acts, just seeing not only how the church operates during this, this early part, uh, but also seeing how the Holy Spirit moves among the people of God. I believe that the book of the Acts is a narrative not just simply about the church. It's the narrative told of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit of God works and moves, how the Holy Spirit is a person. In fact, Ananias and Sapphira are told that they've lied not only unto the apostles, but they've lied to God and that they've lied unto the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is a person and we see his inauguration in chapter number two. We see his reign and his dominion over the earth. We see as he empowers the people of God to to move forward and we see the marvelous work of the gospel. You see, the Christian life is empowered. It is fueled by the gospel message. We have a message of hope. We have a message of sight to the blind, of healing to the sick, of riches to the poor, of life to the dead. There is a powerful message. The apostle Paul would write in the book of Romans, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Romans chapter one, verse 16, for it is the power, the dunamis, the dynamite of God, that it is able to transform the life of the believer. And so I'm submitting to you that the gospel is the power. The gospel is the agent that God uses within his people to communicate hope and communicate truth. And it transforms not only circumstances, but it transforms people. As you look here in Acts chapter number nine, you see how the gospel transforms People. The Apostle Paul is transformed by the gospel message. He is transformed by his encounter with God. The Bible says that no one hath seen God at any time and lived. And so let me unpack that for you very quickly. I do not believe that that is solely talking about having lived uh, um, being alive as the Bible is true, that anyone who has seen God visibly is not alive. They are dead. They are resting in peace until they await their resurrection. But I also believe that that verse is speaking of a person who has seen God cannot remain the same. When you have seen God for who he is, revealed in his glory, in the power and the glory of his might, you cannot be the same person that you used to be. We cannot tell the same lies. We cannot go to the same places. We cannot interact with the same people when we realize that God is who he said he is. And so my prayer for those of you who are watching, those of you who will listen at a later time, those of you who are wandering, that you would for yourself see God in the beauty and in the power of who he is in the fullness of his majesty for then you'll be able to be transformed then you will be transformed then you will live differently and so I'm praying and I pray that you're praying for an encounter a distinct and unique encounter with the only wise and ever-present God and so this morning, let us look in Acts chapter 9 as we see all of heaven breaking loose. And let me submit to you that in this text, there's several chapters that we've skipped last week. We were in chapter number one, and on Wednesday we talked about chapter number two. But there's just been this shaking of circumstances. Peter and John uh, and John have already healed a lame man sitting outside of the temple. They've, their reply to him as he begged for alms was, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto you, rise up and walk. We see the healing, miraculous power of God. We see that even though the, the, the Sanhedrin council and the council of elders in the temple despised this message and had Peter and John thrown in prison and were thought to put them to death, that the Spirit of God frees them from from prison and sends them back into Jerusalem to preach this very same message. We see that God is moving in mighty and miraculous ways. We see that even though the church 
is persecuted under under the leadership of disciples that, that, that the disciple who is Stephen is going to be stoned. And the Bible says he's going to look toward heaven and he says he's going to he's going to say that he sees Jesus standing. I believe that he was receiving a standing ovation from Jesus for standing on his faith and preaching the gospel message in power and in truth. And even though they stoned him to death, the gospel was moved forward. And that was the genesis of the transformation here in the life of Saul. We see God move in mighty and miraculous ways. God begins to work not only in those circumstances, but now we see God working specifically in the life of people. And so I'm submitting to you that God wants to work specifically and uniquely in your life. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. God has something he wants you to do that I cannot do, that are, uh, that others cannot do. It is a specific assignment. It is a purpose. You were built for this. Your experiences have prepared you for this. Your failures have shown you how, how desperately you need God for this. Your upbringing, your background, your experiences, your education, God uses all of that together for his glory and for your good. And so the first thing this morning that I want you to write down as it relates to when all of heaven breaks loose. I want you to write down when God appears to us, he appears in order to alter our pursuits or, or in a more simple fashion, God appears to us in order to alter our pursuits. You see, when all of heaven breaks loose in your life, it'll change what your priorities are. It'll change what, the, what you're seeking after. It'll change what you're looking for. And so I want to submit to you in this, in this personal setting, in, in this this present time during this pandemic, that, that, that the pandemic, when, when all of heaven is breaking loose, that, that there's now, a, I believe, a hunger and a desire for things other than what the world has been pursuing. People want, now that we can't be connected socially, what do people want? People want community. People want to be able to touch one another and love on one another. And as a matter of fact, there was a report that there's the fewest deaths. I believe there's been no deaths in about seven weeks in the city of Miami for the first time since 1957 because people's pursuits are different. People are looking for something different in their life. And so I want you to see here in the beginning of the text that Paul or Saul at the time, he is seeking to destroy this gospel movement. He's already been the one signing off on Stephen's death. And the Bible says in, in chapter number eight <clears throat> that he's going from house to house and he's dragging Christians out of the house and he's persecuting these Christians, these believers, and he's putting them to death and he's throwing them in prison and he decides that there's this movement that's happened in Damascus and he's going to head north into Syria and he is going to stop this movement. He is going to drag it back to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You are going to stop here. Here, we're going to shut this movement down to the best of our ability and as quickly as we can. But let me give you the paradigm. Let me give you the mindset of, the, of, of Saul at the time. Saul is a historian. He is a Hebrew. He is a Jewish person who, who practices Judaism. He is devout in his belief. And he believes that what is happening in the life of these other Jewish people and in these Jewish communities is idolatry. This is the very thing that caused the children of Israel to find themselves numerous times in bondage and in captivity. And so let me kind of give you this, 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 this truth, this nugget that I believe that will benefit you in your walk with Jesus. Idolatry is the gateway into all other sin and iniquity. You see, idolatry is when we take God out of the center and we put another God there, a false God there. If money is at the center, the Bible says that money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Notice money is not the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. When money becomes your idol, it breeds out all other types of iniquity. When murder and mayhem and chaos become your idol, it breeds all other type of, of carnage and destruction. When, when, when sexual uh, uh, promiscuity and physical pleasure becomes your idol, it creates all type of destruction within your home and your life and in your community. And so 
so I'm submitting to you that the idolatry the, is, the, is the genesis of all forms of iniquity, which is why the very first commandment is thou shalt have no other gods before me. In fact, Jesus would summarize it and say that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy might and with all thy strength. And so I'm submitting to you that all heaven breaks loose when God's people put him at the center, when God's people replace all the other false deities in their life and they make him the first and, and, the, and the priority of their lives, what happens is that God then appears to his people and when he appears to us, he transforms, he transitions our pursuits. The apostle Paul is in a pursuit to destroy the church. He's in a pursuit to crush this movement. He is in a pursuit to adhere to his Jewish teachings and to preserve his Jewish customs and traditions. He is afraid of bondage and persecution. He is afraid of captivity. And I'm submitting to you that many of us live the way we live because we have another idol at the center of our life. We have fear at the center of our life. We have frustration at the center of our life. We have our own lusts and desires at the center of our life. And it prohibits us from seeing God in deep and profound and in transformative ways. And so I submit to you that when you get a glimpse of God for who he is, he will transition your pursuits. You will not be pursuing money anymore. You won't pursue fame or fortune. You will pursue the person of none other than Jesus Christ. You will pursue the one who transformed your life. If you read through what remains of the text in chapter number nine, you see that the apostle Paul, after he receives his sight, he goes into a synagogue in Damascus and he begins to preach that Jesus is the son of God. He begins to preach the glorious message of the gospel so much so and God in his divine design has Barnabas there in Damascus to witness this and the apostle Paul leaves Damascus and returns to Jerusalem to say he's been transformed to the apostles and they do not believe him save for the the testimony of Barnabas who says yes in fact Paul was preaching the glorious gospel message and has been transformed. You see, our pursuits must be the kingdom of God. Jesus would teach the disciples to pray, not my kingdom come, but thy will be done. Your kingdom come, God, your will be done. As in heaven, so in earth. I submit to you this morning and I implore you and encourage you this morning. I, I implore you to pray and to seek God that his kingdom might come. That this pandemic might cause the glorious gospel to go forward. Because it is then that it will transition the pursuits of our nation. It will transition the pursuits of our churches. It will transition the pursuits of people individually. It will transition the pursuits of cities and counties and countries. It will transition the pursuits of us and our individual individual lives, when the gospel, when the power of the gospel is preached, when the spirit of God is, when we are fully surrendered to the power of the spirit of God, we will see our pursuits and our passions transition and the gospel will go forward and the lives of others will be changed. And so I want you to see that God has the power to change people and God changes the pursuits of those people. God appears to us in order to change, to transition our pursuits. But not only does God appear to us in order to transition our pursuits, all of heaven will break loose and God will appear to us in order to appear through us. And so the second point is God appears to us in order to appear through us. Notice if you read with me in the remainder of the text, there is this disciple who is there in Damascus named Ananias, not the Ananias who lied to the Holy Spirit with Sapphira, his wife, and was dead and instantly killed there on the spot, but another disciple with the same name, Ananias, is there, and he is praying, and he is given a vision from God of this man named Saul, whose life he is going to change. And out of fear of Paul's history, he he, pu he pushes back. He, he tells God, I, I don't know if this is the right thing to do because this is the same Saul who has 
carried those who follow you into captivity. He has killed them. He has thrown them in prison. And he is here in this very place to do it again. And God says this to Ananias. He says, arise. He says, go forward. Go where I've told you to go because I have a plan for Saul. I have a plan for his life. And I want you to see through this narrative that God has a plan for your life. Let me submit to you, if your life is filled with failures, if your life is filled with ignorance, if your life is filled with shortcomings, welcome to the club. There's not a single Christian who doesn't have shortcomings, who doesn't have failures in their life, who doesn't have a past, who doesn't have a history of things that they've done that they shouldn't have done, things that they've said that they shouldn't have said. And I'm submitting to you that that is not at all a discount from God, that God still sees your value. In fact, God chooses foolish things. God chooses broken things. God chooses people with failures and tattered past because it is he who gets the glory. If you read through the Bible, Moses was a murderer. Moses was, in, in fact, in many of us, he was, a, he was a coward. He fled out of Egypt. Gideon was, was, was specifically and emphatically a coward. He was hiding. He was scared when God used him. Samson was a womanizer. Samson had an issue with, with physical pleasure. He was a man filled with pride, yet God used him mightily. Peter was one who denied Jesus three times. There are so many stories. Rahab was a harlot. There are so many people in the Bible who have brokenness in their life, and God chooses to use them not for their glory, not for their stature, but so that he might get the glory, so that God might receive the honor, so that God might appear to others. And so God wants to use your brokenness, your sinful, your sinful past, your hurts, your failures, your fears. He wants to use those and work through them so that he will get the glory and he will get the majesty. I don't know about you, but that is a place of praise because I, for one, am not perfect. I have made mistakes, and I submit to you, as long as I'm human, there will be more mistakes made, some intentionally, some unintentionally. But I'm submitting to you that God has a plan for your life, that God has factored into his, his algorithm. He has factored into his calling on your life that there are failures. In fact, for us who are beyond the cross, every single failure, your every fault, every sin, Jesus knew those things and he still got on the cross. He called you despite those failures. And so God is calling you not for your fame or your fortune or your glory or your glamour. God is calling you because he wants to appear and bless the life of others. As you read through the remainder of the text, it is Paul who is also praying and seeking the will of God. He has been smitten with blindness because of this glorious light that he's seen. And it's been approximately three days. I believe that that's not by design. I believe that that, that is an alluding to the resurrection, that there's three days, right? Jesus was raised on the third day. Here we see the apostle Peter, or rather the apostle Paul, uh, who is Saul at the time. He's going to be transformed in three days. And I want to submit to you, here's a parenthetical. Look at your neighbor, type in the comments. It doesn't take that long. It don't take that long. It doesn't take 12 months. It doesn't take 40 years. It doesn't, listen, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief. And it wasn't a journey that took that long. I'm submitting to you that the transitions in the life of others, including your life, don't take that long. God can make you into a person who's pursuing him passionately today. God can transition you from being lost to being found today. God can give you, from, he can move you from death to life today. He can move you from despair to hope today. He can move you from lies and deception to truth today. That God is able to do, this is a parenthetical, God is able to do things in, in short 
shorter times than we think. Just like God could wake up and look at the seas and rebuke them and tell them, peace be still. God can transition this country, this nation, this globe today from this pandemic. God has that kind of power. And God is more concerned about our character than he is our comfort. And so while you consider this pandemic, yes, God can transition us from pandemic to being free and opening up our states and counties again. But our God is more important with transitioning us from those who are unbelieving to those who are believing, from those who are stingy to those who are generous, from those who are hateful to those who are loving, from those who are broken to those who are whole and are healers of others who are broken. God wants to transition you and I, and so he appears to you in order so that he might appear through you to someone else. In the life of Ananias, Jesus appears to him and transitions his life and uses him to go to the to Saul and to touch Saul and to see the blindness that he had go away because he has a plan for his life. And so I want to encourage you today. I want to ask you, I want to implore you. You say, well, what is this next step? I, I, I believe that we need to, to pray that God's kingdom come and God's will be done. I believe that we need to come to this place where we see God for who he is and our pursuits change. That we're no longer seeking wealth and seeking riches and seeking fame. The Bible says Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 would say, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I believe that if we pursue the kingdom, the expansion of the kingdom of God, that all the other stuff, the ancillary stuff, the ulterior stuff will come in its proper place. But if we if we pursue all of the ancillary, all of the ulterior stuff and not the kingdom of God, all of those things fall apart. Nations fall apart. Economies fall apart. Relationships fall apart. But when God is at the center, when God is the priority, when God has the preeminence, all of those things remain and they expand and they impact and bless the lives of others. And so, yes, when God appears to us, it'll totally and radically change our pursuit. But when God appears to us, we must remember that God has appeared to us so that he can appear to others through us so that we can put our hands upon people. And listen, I'm not saying that we ought to go and just start touching a bunch of people. In fact, we've got social distancing going on right now. And so I would encourage you to to, to be very cautious, be very weary of who you put your hands on. In fact, the Bible says, and of course it's out of context when I'm saying it here, but lay hands on no man suddenly. So that's not the appropriate context, but that is a principle that we ought to be very mindful of who we, who we appoint, who we ordain, and who we say this person is a special person and an appointed person, who we appoint quickly. But, but let, me, let, me, let me come back to the point. The point is that we ought to use our hands to touch those and heal others, not just from their physical ailments, but from their emotional ailments. There are people right now dealing with fear and they need your touch. They need your phone call. They need a word of encouragement. There are people right now dealing with guilt and shame and they need a word of comfort and they need a word of consolation. They need your touch. Parents, your children need a touch. Children, your parents <coughs> need a touch. Pastors, your, 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 your flock need a touch. Flock, your pastor needs a touch. I'm submitting to you that there are people within your circle and those in the community who need your touch. There are homeless people, broken people, people whose lives are, 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 are racked with bondage and sin who need the touch of the people of God. They need a word from you. And so you say, well, I, I can't touch those people because of social distancing. You don't have to touch people physically in order to touch them. You touch them with words. You can touch them through your social media. You can touch them through the things that you post on your page. Let me ask you, the things that you post on your page, are they comforting people? Are they encouraging people? Are they bringing glory to Jesus? Or are they condemning people? Are they tearing people down? Are they dividing people? The things that you say to those that you say that you love, your children, your spouse, your co-workers, are those things uplifting them? Is it? Are you ministering grace to the hearers or are you tearing them down? Are you condemning them? Are you negative? I'm submitting to you that God wants to appear to you so that he can reveal himself to others through you. And we see this here in the chapter number nine, 
And so I'll close with this. As you see, as the chapter concludes, Peter is going to be influenced and transformed once again by this story that Barnabas tells about Paul being transformed by the gospel. And it in turn fuels him to go into Jerusalem and continue the miraculous work of the gospel message. And so you wonder, what next? What now? My prayer for you, child of God, is that you, through the word of God, will be touched by God so that you are empowered by him to carry this message of sight to the blind, of healing to the sick, of riches to the poor, of peace to those with worry, of hope to those with despair, of life to those in death, that you would preach a glorious gospel, that you would proclaim the wonderful works of God, that you would tell them of Jesus, that those who are afraid in this pandemic and are going through financial times, hardships, that are going through difficulties with their business and employment, that are going through challenges. You got parents who are pulling their hair out because they got their kids home all day, all week long. I'm submitting to you that you have been empowered by the Spirit of God to be able to touch those lives and impact people with the beauty and the splendor of the gospel. You don't have to be a preacher like me to tell people of Jesus. You don't have to be the pastor of a church to lead people into a relationship with Christ. Just allow Jesus to live through you. Allow him to appear miraculously to you so that he can miraculously appear to others. And finally, if you're a person who God has never appeared to, you, you've, you've missed his appearing. He's wandered through your life and you fail to see his touch. You fail to see his presence and you've rejected him all this time. I'm submitting to you that God will reveal himself. He continues to woo us and draw us and get us to choose to believe and put our faith in him. And so if you are a person without faith, if you are a person who has not trusted Christ and you're on this live stream or watching this replay, I'm submitting to you that the gospel is available to you, that the message of the cross is applicable to you, that the hope in a savior is available to you. And it's very simple. All you have to do is put your trust in Jesus. You don't have to be a member of a church. You don't have to have a certain amount of money. You don't have to live in a certain city. You don't have to clean up your life and do a whole bunch of good stuff. Salvation is offered freely. It is offered to anyone who will trust Jesus. It is provided for you, not because of what you've done, not because of who you know. It is offered to you because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And so I want to encourage you uh, this morning that if you have not put your faith in Jesus, that you would for yourself witness these marvelous transformations that God is able to do in the life of people and submit to that transformation in your very own life. And if you are a person of the faith who has placed your trust in Jesus, but has, but has, but has, but has wavered, but has wandered, but your faith has waned, I encourage you to come back to the beauty of the gospel message, to rehearse the gospel again, to see that it can change lives, to see, don't get discouraged about the people in the community, about the president, about craziness happening in the lives of people around us. Know that God is able to take a Saul and turn him into Paul. Know that God is able to take a broken man and make him whole. Know that God is able to heal a person who is sick. Know that God is able to take a person whose heart is hard, whose heart is hard and soften their heart. God is able to do that in the lives of those that you perhaps have lost hope with, but God is also able to do that in your life. And so if you've wandered from the faith, if your faith is wavering, if you don't feel as strong or as close to God as you want to, or you know you should, I'm submitting to you. If you come back to the gospel and God shows himself to you again through his word, it'll change the passion of your life. It'll change the pursuit of your life, but God will not only change you, he'll use you to change those that you love.